conversations where maybe he asked her a question and she responded by saying this because there was other stuff going on she never addressed. It can manifest itself through withdrawing or avoiding the person. Um, it can manifest through anger, manipulation, resentment, all sorts of uh, different ways. But I thought this was a good illustration. So what are some causes of conflict? And I know, like I said, I'm going to run through some of this, so when we get to the application, we have a little bit more time. Take a minute. Um, I'll, I can read through these, especially also if anyone is streaming so you can see what's up here. And then if there's anything additional, we can add it. So any form of conflict could be caused by, or different forms of conflict may be caused by, the unreasonable supervisor. Has anyone ever experienced that kind of conflict? Okay. 
the difficult person. That per he's just difficult. That person is just difficult, right? The ambitious colleague, someone who you're working with or even if you're studying with and they're just so ambitious and that ambition gets in the way and creates conflict between you and that person. Safety concerns, value differences, which is a big one. Misunderstanding, Some, a lot of conflict is based on misunderstanding, not fully understanding either what the person's position is or how, why they are expressing their position in a certain way. Ethical problems, people's ethics, values, moral systems are different. Work styles, so maybe two people are given the same task but they, don't, they can't understand or appreciate the different ways that they arrive at the task. Cultural differences, this should be a big one for us. In fact, I have to pause and share the story. I went to the library today to, to prepare the talk, um, and a man walked into the reference library, a tall, thin, um, Polish man, and he walked up, and the, the library's like really quiet, there's like a scattering of people, and he goes up to him, he goes, ah, in broken Polish, he's like really loud, I'm Polish, no English, I need job now. And he was, and the whole library just turned around and I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I feel, I feel horrible for the man, I feel horrible for the librarian, and he goes, that's my daughter, and then he like says her name in Polish, like it's like this long name, and that's my son, and my wife lost her job, and, and it's like a big conflict, it's a problem, and you have to find me a job, and so we can totally unpack that, but this man, you know, was, was so just full of, um, Concern, and then in the end, all they said to him is go to Google and look for jobs. And he said, Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's a cultural difference. Obviously, this man just wanted to feel heard, I think, was part of it. So that's a, and for us as Egyptians, you know, whatever cultural background, those differences can, can create conflict, even when conflict isn't really there. Um, internal competition, internal to a family, to an organization, to a church. External competition between two, um, two parties or more. Substance abuse can get in the way of a lot of conflict. Role confusion, not really sure. What's your role in this situation? What's your role in the house? Are you the one that's supposed to be doing this or am I supposed to be doing that? Um, and scheduling conflicts. This is just like an example. Obviously, conflicts, I mean, you know, looking at me the wrong way can be a conflict, you know? Anything can be a, can be a cause of conflict. Anything like major that you feel is missing that we should add? Okay, well, we're gonna do a thing, my, I like to do a little talk in turn just so it's applicable. So in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to talk in turn, um, turn and talk, whichever way you wanna do it. And you're gonna do, I'm gonna ask you to very, very briefly do the following. One, I want you to, to describe a conflict that you were in or that you witnessed. That should be easy, okay? That should be pretty easy. How did you understand the cause or the causes of the conflict, the major cause of the conflict? What do you think was the major cause? Three, how did you respond to the conflict? In other words, what was your role? How did you respond to it? And four, were you satisfied with the outcome? If there was an outcome, maybe it's still unresolved. And I'll give you an example, because you know I like to put myself out there when I ask you to do something. Um, so here's a story of, yeah, here's a story of a girl named Maggie from my school who was removed from the school back in August. She was removed because of safety concerns in her home with her family. Um, she was taken to, she was actually evaluated and told to go back home. And she refused to go back home because she felt unsafe, so she ran away. We found her. And that at that point, she said all the right things that she needed to say in order for um, the state that, or to, that stepped in. They took her and they put her in a residential facility, which is like a home where you know, kids can stay if they um, are deemed to be unsafe at home. So the long story short is Maggie stayed out of school for about a month in this residential facility with all these other troubled girl youth. And after a lot of conversations and a lot of battles with her family and her counselor, I was, and I worked with her obviously because I'm, I'm her counselor in school, I got her to come back to school. Now, the thing that 
really um, erupt, you know, sort of erupted and caused Maggie's family to threaten her and to be unsafe towards her was something that was related to her and her boyfriend. Something was exposed related to her and her boyfriend and it caused a big problem in the home and there was a lot of threats made and so on and so forth. So I did a lot of work with her and I even visited her in the residential facility. I did a lot of work with the, the boyfriend in the school and how we're gonna move forward. I talked to the mom. All this was done. And I, I earned her respect and I earned her trust. And so kind of just fast forwarding, the last week of school, our schedule was very different because there's no more classes, the kids come and go. So I, we had an agreement that Maggie would come to school only when she needed to be there. So one of the days we only had school from 10 to 12 for the kids. But she said, oh, Ms. Soriel, I really want to come to school um, because there's an award ceremony at 5 o'clock in the evening. I said, okay, Maggie. I said, I'm telling you right now, if I approve for you to come to school and I tell your outside counselor, the only time you can leave school is at 12 o'clock, you go get lunch, and you come back and you work in the school building. You don't go with your boyfriend. I was very, very clear with her. So what did Maggie do? She left the school building, she went out, she rescued a stray cat, and she had wonderful stories to bring back about why she was out of the building for five hours and missed the award ceremony. So the way, so that's that's the conflict. The conflict that was that she, I, I felt that she disrespected my my trust. She took advantage of it. How did I understand the cause of the conflict? Clearly, she wanted to be with her boyfriend because she has no freedom and no flexibility anywhere else. So she took advantage, and the cause of the conflict was she put her interest to be with the boyfriend above her word that she gave me that she wouldn't leave. How did I respond to the conflict? Well, when she came back that evening for the award ceremony, I, just based on the scene that I observed, I wasn't gonna address it. So the next morning, I privately brought Maggie into my office, I talked with her, and I reasoned with her, I told her how I felt, and I, and I told her I was gonna notify the outside counselor and that she had breached the trust that I had for her and she's gonna have to rebuild it and so forth. And was I satisfied with the outcome? Yes, in general I was. Um, you know, I was satisfied. So that, that's my story of a conflict, how I understood it, what I thought the causes of, was, were of it, um, how I responded, and what, my, what I thought of the outcome. So take about two minutes, turn to someone, one or two people next to you, and share, share the following that's, that's up here, please.
souls if they'd like to share out uh, before we move on, just so we can have the, the conflict really be um, tangible. Okay, who would like to share an example of a conflict that you either witnessed or that you were a part of? No. I have a conflict with myself. But we're not talking about internal conflict. Anybody? One brave soul? I mean, this could be like in the supermarket. It doesn't have to be too, like, you know, dramatic. I was not satisfied with the outcome. <laughs> and uh, we eventually, you know, I apologized to him, he apologized to me. But we completely misunderstood each other. And it was not even really the, the topic that was a point of stress. It was outside things that were happening. So I know I'm being vague. But no, but, yeah. but that's, yeah. I mean, that's a great example because I think that could be that could really describe a lot of our conflicts, which is based, it sounds like it's based on misunderstanding, and other things that come into the conflict that have nothing to do with the conflict are either stress or feeling you know, overworked. Um, and how you responded is very typical too, anger, shouting, um, just whatever feels you know, right in that moment that might be impulsive, right? And you weren't satisfied, but it, over time you were able to resolve it. Thank you, okay. So, I know for some of you, you've, you know, I, I use this, this passage a lot, but we have to, you know, it's the same concept of, when we talk about sin entering the world, we have to talk also about conflict entering the world. Um, from harmony to conflict. So if we, if we were to open the Bible and just look at the beginning, we would see Genesis 1 is all about the harmony, the perfect, beautiful harmony that to this day is still studied by scientists, philosophers, historians, you know, everything. Every word in that scripture is so perfected that God's harmony for his, all his creation, including, including us, humanity, along with nature, along with the environment, everything was created in perfect harmony. Um, that was Genesis 1. And now when we go to Genesis 3, we see how uh, sin entered the world. And that was through the disobedience and the, of, of Adam and Eve and their separation from God. So here we see that oh, I'm going to use the light. Um, so conflict is the result of sin directly. The sin is the result of disobedience. Follow this train of thought because the, the conclusion um, from this is going to be important. Disobedience is the result of choice to be separated or disunited, disunion from God. And the choice for disunion from God is the result of pride. Okay? Again, conflict is the result of sin. Sin, the result of disobedience. Disobedience, the result of the choice for separation or disunion from God. And the choice for disunion from God is the result of pride. Um, so, having reviewed that and seen it since the beginning, resolving conflict effectively requires a humble, repentant, and self-aware approach. And that's really, really critical to everything we're going to discuss. Because conflict resolution, we can talk about techniques and skills and all this stuff, but really at the heart of it, and this is, again, regardless if, if it's two people, two families, two churches, two co countries, Unless there is some humility, some form of repentance, and some form of self, and, and, and a, not some, but a good amount of self-awareness, that conflict is probably not going to be resolved effectively. This has everything to do with who we are and, and how we are created in God's image and likeness. In order to restore harmony, 
which is what we were created for, harmony and union with God, we need to rid ourselves of pride, which means we need to approach uh, the situation in humility. So in Joe's example, if his dad and him both came to it and said, you're the problem, or you're wrong and I'm right, and they ended it there, there's no room for, for resolution. There's no room for reconciliation. There's no room for understanding. There's no room for forgiveness, okay? So there had to be a little bit of humility. There had to be a little bit of self-awareness that Joe, maybe either in the beginning or maybe not even till the next day, could say, you know, part of that was related to me just being stressed out. That was self-awareness on his part. That was some humility on his part. And that was, sorry, that was a willingness for him to be repentant or remorseful, okay? Um, in, in Hebrew, the word shalom, which is used a lot in the Bible, um, in the Bible translation, it means peace. In the English translation, sadly, all it means is the absence of war or tension. But the complete definition of peace or of shalom, completeness and wholeness, or communion with God, with others, and with creation, which includes the environment. Jesus is the king of peace. To have complete peace, it means to be in full communion with God, with each other, and with nature. So if th th this goes to the idea that, you know, um, and sadly, I hear this a lot. I had to, I had to deal with a, a conflict with a student in my school who was going through a horrible just season of her life where she's sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night, she's stealing money from her grandmother. I mean, she's going through all these horrible, you know, decisions because she wants to go out to these rave parties and, you know, it's all about, you know, her the stage she's in and what she's not getting at home. Well, this was a very serious meeting that we needed to have and the hardest part of the meeting wasn't getting the student to come. It was getting the mom and her sister, who are the two people in her life who are taking care of her, to sit in a room together because they haven't spoken together for two years. And we hear that we hear that a lot. And sadly, it's not usually the person you work with or the person you study with. Sometimes it's the people you grew up with, either in your family or close friends, that we have these conflict with, conflicts with. And what I want to say here is what God calls for us is not just communion with him. I can be a servant, I can come to church, I can be a good Christian, I can wear my cross, but if I'm in conflict or disunion with my brother or my sister, then I'm not in whole communion with God either. Because his commandment was not, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, period. The second part of that was, and love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor is, is every other person. Right? Every other person created the image of likeness of God. So the challenge for us as Christians, it's really easy to, for me to leave my conflict, of my work conflict at work. But what about the conflict I have at home, or the conflict I have at church, or the conflict I have with my family? And please, there's wisdom in how we handle conflict, and there's wisdom in when we let things go. And I'm not gonna get into that too much right now, because it's not the topic, but there is wisdom in letting things go, but there's not wisdom in, in accepting the conflict in a way that is, um, that is clearly unhealthy and breeding um, tension or a lack of peace or a lack of unity for me, for the other person, and for our relationship with God. So I wanted to uh, mention that before we go on. So in, in Chinese, um, I don't know if you've seen this before, but there are two characters, two Chinese characters that it's in, in Chinese, they spell kanji. And the first character alone means danger. The second character alone means opportunity. But in Chinese, when you write the characters together, they actually mean crisis. And it's really interesting because crisis, or what we could call conflict, is exactly this. It's danger. It's something that's risky and dangerous, but that allows for opportunity. Conflict is not all bad. Conflict... Have, imagine we didn't have conflict. Imagine everyone always agreed about everything. We wouldn't grow. We wouldn't have competition in the world to, to challenge each other, to try to be better, to try to seek the truth on a deeper level. So conflict in and of itself is not bad. It's just an opportunity, um, and it depends how we approach that opportunity um, in that difficulty or in that danger. 
So our call is to be reconciled. We always talk about the Great Commission. Go and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the Great Commission. My challenge and the Bible, the Bible challenges us really before we can ever fulfill the Great Commission is we need to be reconciled. And to be reconciled means to bring into agreement or harmony. It comes back to the same thing. If we're not in agreement or harmony with God and with one another, then ha- and that actually is the greatest detriment, in my opinion, to the church, to the church of God, is when we as Christians profess to baptize, to preach, to witness, and we are not. I'm not saying we're not. We're, we have to be perfect, but we're not struggling to be reconciled in our own life, in our own walk. And hypocrisy is, you know, it's it's the biggest flaw to. Um, to the Christian community. We have to at least be actively struggling and working towards reconciliation and peace. So this verse I highlighted for you, the word reconciled is used in four ways. And um, we are gonna read it because it's important. Someone else, since my voice might be putting some of you to sleep here. Um, can someone read this verse for us please? Because it's, it's pretty important to understand this call to reconcile. Olivia? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not inputting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Right, so God has reconciled us. He's already reconciled us to himself. He's already brought us into agreement. He's brought us back into a relationship of harmony through grace, through the work of the Holy Spirit. And he calls us to do the same if anyone, and this is the clause, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It is only if we are in Christ and abiding in Christ that we can fulfill this great call, this challenge to be reconciled with God and with everyone. This is completely against our nature on some level. But God says, if you are in me, you can do it. Because if you are in me, I will do it for you. And the work of the Holy Spirit will be working um, through you so that we also can be committed to the work of reconciliation. So you have some handouts. Um, We're gonna look at those now. And there's a lot of information. You're probably gonna take them home if you choose to, you should probably study them because I'm going to run through them quickly. Yeah, where are the experts right here? The first one is approaches to conflict and negotiation. I'm going to, again, briefly go through these for the sake of time. You can take them and study them further. Can we get some to um, the young man in the back? So in general, in general, we can approach conflict in one of two ways. Either, stay with me because I only have like 20 minutes and I'm trying to be mindful of time. Either we can approach a conflict situation from a competitive stance, which means I'm coming at this situation with lack of trust, lack of information, and I'm coming at it expecting someone's gonna win and someone's gonna lose. So I'm coming into the conversation with um, with Maggie. I'm gonna just keep the example all the way through so it's simple. I brought her into my office and I expect in that conflict, in that conversation, I wanna come out a winner and she's gonna come out the loser because she's the one that made the mistake. Or, in general, I'm gonna approach the conflict from a collaborative stance, which means I wanna gain more information. I want to grow in this situation and understand more. What really caused her to take that decision to leave? Okay, I have some trust. I still trust her. I'm still giving her some benefit of the doubt. I want to understand the whole picture. And in this case, win-win. I'm looking for the con. I'm approaching the conflict, hoping that I can be a winner, and she too can come out as a winner. That there could be increased understanding and some level of collaboration. So turn that sheet over. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through this. You can study it at home, but I, I will. I will give you one example because I think it's funny. I thought Abuna would be here. When you compare different way, different uh, uh, strategies for 
handling conflict. This is how you'll read this. If there, if it is a cooperative of, so he's, he's here just in time. If I'm approaching the conflict in a cooperative way, okay, towards collaboration, increased understanding, if the relationship is important, where mutual support is necessary over time, I'm just reading what's on the paper. So in the example of Maggie, she's only in ninth grade. I'm gonna work with her if I stay at the school, potentially three more years. So it's not like this is a student like Kalas, I don't have to deal with her again. I have a relationship I need to maintain for three more years. So in that case, um, since the relationship is important, that's um, I'm gonna approach it in a more, I should approach it in a more cooperative way. I should be more interested in sharing and understanding and trusting because that relationship is different than if it was a competitive situation and I'm approaching the relationship where I don't care. It's a one time, like it says here, it's a one time deal. And an example of that would be, for example, you drive, you go to the uh, Starbucks drive through this is for you Abuna, yeah. and uh, you know, the person totally gets your order wrong, you just repeated the order three times, they still got it wrong, you're late for an appointment, you're really annoyed, and you're ticked off, and you give the person an attitude because it's like a one-time thing. This person doesn't, isn't, does, isn't doing their job right, they're wrong, I'm right, I'm gonna blow up because I, I never have to see them again. So the relationship in that case is not as important, but in Abuna's case, it would still be important because Abuna goes through drive through at Starbucks over and over again. So he would have to maintain the Absolutely. relationship and keep it cooperative even, right, even <laughs> still, right? So you can go through these. They basically are a comparison based on how you approach um, the situation in that conflict, okay? Look at the other, the yellow handout. So there are different methods to resolve conflict. You can, I'm just looking right here on the top. It says conflict resolution methods. It's really helpful to be aware. I know it's a lot of information, but as we become aware of this, it actually is useful because it helps us to realize we have options. When you're in a conflict, sometimes, I know for me, when it's really stressful or time is an issue, like sometimes it feels like there is no other choice. It's just a win-lose situation and that's it. But there really are options, especially you know for us as adults. We can either avoid, and if you look at the bottom, if in general, if, if I choose to avoid the conflict, then most likely my focus is to deny or to escape from it. So if I didn't want to deal with Maggie, I could have just avoided her. I didn't have to call her into my office. I, I could have said, I, I don't want to deal with another student. This is literally the day before the last day of school. Kefeya, I'm going to let it go. So if, I, if that was my approach to just avoid it or to deny it, or sorry, to deny or escape, I would have avoided the conflict. If I chose to negotiate, that means I am interested in what her interests or what her needs are. Uh, if I chose to negotiate, that means I'm also interested in my own needs and my own interests in the situation. Another way is to mediate. Mediate, who knows the difference between negotiating and mediating in general? You, you should all of these. <laughs> I don't know, I think negotiating, you're like furthering an interest, a specific interest, but mediating, you're trying to come to like a happy medium kind of for both parties. Yeah, there's definitely more of that. And in a mediation, you typically have a third party, which is also one of the differences. You're now introducing a neutral third party to mediate. So with you and your dad's situation, if it got to a point where you said, you know what? We're not coming to an understanding. Mom, come here. We want, well, I don't know if she would be neutral, but that, that, would, be, that would be showing that there's still some interest in your needs and your father's needs to come to um, some understanding. To arbitrate. Mark, Mark, uh, had a question. Um, I was gonna say, um, mediating also, isn't that uh, when the third party <coughs> will come to, say, like a conclusion? Isn't that like uh, a mandatory, 
that you can no, you can actually choose mediation. So in a lot of like family court issues, like it's your choice. If you want a mediator, you can actually choose a med to have a mediator, or you can choose to go through the courts in a, in another ma manner. Sometimes it's mandated, and sometimes it's it's no, not. No, I'm saying but once there is a mediator, uh -huh. but then the conclusion that mediator comes to is that like a finalized like thing. Um, I think usually it is. Otherwise, the, yeah, I think usually it is. It depends on the situation again. Like if it's an informal mediation, there's a little bit more flexibility, but if it's a court-ordered mediation or if it's a, um, you know, even in, in a lot of companies they have mediation, like for employees, then yeah, usually they bring that mediator in to, to like kind of figure it out and close that case. With um, arbitration or a grievance, and these are all language like you guys will probably become more familiar with, that's when you're really concerned about your rights. Um, with a litigation, that's probably what you're most familiar with, or if you're an attorney, a litigation is when you're bringing in like a judge um, to litigate the situation and to come um, in with a final decision. But there's also like a power, there's a bit more of a power um, dynamic going on there. Um, and the, the concern again, or the focus is the rights, as well as the power. That's why you see the line for litigate connected both to the rights, as well as now there's, a, there's an element of power. You have a judge. Um, Who's going to speak? Who's going to speak? Sort of the final decision, and then the final thing in terms of dealing with conflict is a fight. We're just going to fight it out, and that could be verbal fighting, it could be physical fighting, it could be you know nuclear bomb fighting, whatever it is. Um, and that usually is when you're just um, your main focus is power. And sadly, when we look at countries across the, the world, a lot of countries bypass a lot of these things or they fake a lot of these other things and they revert um, often to a power play and that's why we unfortunately see more wars today and fights than we would like. Okay, on the back of that paper, we're gonna take a, a brief minute to look here. I want you to try to envision in most cases when you're in a conflict, okay, when you're in a situation of disagreement with others, um, where do you lie on the spectrum? So on the bottom here, on this axis over here, uh, the X, this is the level to which you want to satisfy others' concerns. And on the Y axis, it's the, your attempt to satisfy your own. So here's an example. If, for example, um, I'm only concerned about Maggie and her concerns and her needs, or specifically her concerns in the situation that I gave earlier. Um, but I'm not really concerned about myself. Like, you know, like some people, like, they're always, no, no, you know, I have to, I have to see what's wrong with the other person. Whatever they need, I have to figure it out. I'm, whatever it takes, I'm gonna make sure they're happy at the end of this. I'm gonna make sure they're taken care of. If I'm that kind of person, and I just want to satisfy the, the concern of the other, then I'm going to do one of two things. Either I'm going to, either I'm going to completely avoid them, like I said I could do with Maggie. I just, uh, admit the, I mean, honestly, she has a very difficult life. She has a lot of problems. Like she has a lot going on for her. And if maybe my stance was, you know what, I don't want to add to her plate. I don't want to yani, add more more stress to her life and, and more conflict to her, her day. I could, and I'm, I'm someone who's not yeah, I mean, assertive. I don't know how to assert my opinion. I don't know how to speak up. I don't know how to take a position. Then I'm just gonna avoid her. And that would be right here, right? So I'm concerned. Um, I wanna satisfy her concern, but I don't care about my own concerns. So I'm right here, right? Because I'm unassertive. But if I'm assertive, which I am, what did I do? I, I care about her needs. In, in my case, I do care about her needs, but I do also care about mine. If I didn't care about her needs at all, and I said, and I just felt hurt by her, and I wanted to you know, take advantage of the situation, I would have brought her in, and I would have turned it into a very competitive situation. You know what? You defied what I told you in my office. You're gonna, this is gonna be reported to the dean, you're gonna be expelled, whatever the case. It could have become very competitive, right? If I am concerned for her um, and my own needs, like I'm, I'm concerned for her, but I'm also um, concerned for my what, what I think is right, and I'm somewhat assertive, 
then I would be willing to compromise. I would be willing to compromise and get, have a little bit more give and take. Collaboration, which is all the way on the top right, is when I'm concerned about the other person and I am also willing to assert, um, I don't wanna back down from what I think or what I believe. This is really important. A lot of times people think that to show concern for someone means like, Khalas, I have to close my mouth. I have to act like yeah, I mean, everything is okay. No, I can be concerned about Maggie, which I am. I've done a lot for her. But at the same time, I also feel um, very strongly that, and assertively, that she needs to take responsibility for the choices she made. So I can approach it also in a, in a collaborative way. So these are just all different sort of like spectrum depending on the level of concern and the level of assertiveness. All right, that's a lot. That's, I mean, that's usually something you go over in a couple of days, but we're gonna move on for the sake of time. We'll get through as much as we can. So one of the things you can do, application, you wanna do something called the reframing formula. If you can identify your position in a conflict, and you can identify the position of the other person, that's not enough. You have to go beyond that and, and identify the underlying need and the need of your, your need and the other. So position, my position is, I told you not to leave the school. Her position is she left the school. My need is that you respect what I asked you. Her need is I wanna spend time with my boyfriend. How can the priority needs for all parties be satisfied? So the reframing is to ask the question like this. Okay, Maggie, I know it's important for you to spend time with your boyfriend. It's also important for me that when I ask you something that you respect it and you keep your word. How can we mutually try to satisfy each other's needs? That question does something. And it doesn't have to be so formal, but it shifts the climate from competitive to collaborative. The way we create a climate in a, in a difficult conversation has a lot to do with how that other person is gonna respond. So when she came into my office, if the first thing I said is, um, I don't appreciate the fact that you left the school after you told me you wouldn't, if that was the first thing out of my mouth, how do you think her reaction is gonna be? Defensive. Defensive. Is she gonna be willing to hear me? No. No. Um, but if the first thing I said to her is, you know, Maggie, I know you don't have a chance to see your boyfriend. I know that your time with him is very limited and it's really important for you to spend time with him. It was really important for me when I asked you to stay in the building that you kept your word. How can we, moving forward, try to you know, reconcile your needs being met as well as you're keeping your word to me? It just creates a whole different climate. I just has a quick cool question mm -hmm. for that last part. Mm -hmm. What if the priority needs can't be satisfied for both parties? Um, are you coming to that? Or? I mean, we are going to get to it in four minutes. I mean, the last four minutes that okay. we have. But in general, what I would say, and we'll, we'll get, actually, we'll just go to the next thing. You know, the convert, difficult conversations, usually they feel like linear. Like it's, you're, you, you, you see this, I see that, and that's it. But the truth is, in every conflict, and, and I, I have a book actually that you know I would recommend if, if anyone's interested. It's called Difficult Conversations. I'll just pull it out really quickly. This next part comes from this book, essentially. And it talks about, and it's really, it's true, when you kind of sit and chew on this for a while, in any conflict, disagreement, difficult situation, it's almost never black and white. It's almost never right and wrong. It's almost never, almost, I'm saying never um, just yes or no. It's almost never, because the person's position is always gonna be informed by their needs. Their needs are gonna be informed by their experiences. Their experiences are informed by their perceptions. So even in the end, if um, someone as clear cut as your decision, your decision to drink and drive, you can say more. How could you say there's not a right and wrong? Of course it's wrong to drink and drive, yes. However, even in a conflict, 17-year-old boy just got his license, comes home, he got into a car accident, he was drinking and driving. Mom is like, you are not getting into another car, you're not, getting a, you're not gonna drive this car again, you're not this, you're not that. Of course, what's that mom thinking? 
I'm 100% right, and you're 100% what? Wrong. However, what I'm, what I'm trying to explain here is that in a conflict situation, there is, there is learning, there's information sharing that can help not to prove who's right and wrong, but to help decide how to bring that, con that difficult conversation, that conflict, into, a, into more light, into more understanding. Because a lot of times, there's a lack of understanding. There's a lack of the full picture. But why, why did that kid choose to drink? Why did that kid choose to drive? Um, it's not to excuse what happened, but it's to understand it. So Huna, kind of getting to what you're asking, it's, it's, it's greater than the conflict itself, okay? So in, in a difficult conversation, there's really three things happening. And I'm gonna go really quickly here. What, oh, sorry. What actually happened? Okay, what am I and the other person feeling? So there's, what impact does the conversation have on my view and others' view of my identity? So the three pieces are what really, ha what happened? Kid got into a car, drank and got into a car accident. What am I feeling? Mom's feeling like you're a total, you're a bum, you're a failure, you're an embarrassment to my family. And the kid is feeling, you know, maybe guilty, maybe you're never there for me, all you do is yell at me, whatever he's feeling. What impact is the conversation having on my identity? Mom is thinking, oh my goodness, everyone's gonna know about this. What are your teachers gonna think? What's your father gonna think? What are your, what's your church gonna think? And the kid's thinking like, oh my goodness, I'm an athlete, what is this gonna mean for me on my team? There's an identity piece there, okay? So it's much more than just what you see. So the what happened conversation, it's not just about getting the facts straight is what I'm saying. You can, in most situations, any investigative situation, you can eventually get to the fact. That's not, so what I'm saying is we spend a lot of time in a conflict just trying to prove who's right and wrong. We need to get past that and shift away from the truth assumption, which is I'm right and you're wrong, into, um, into and away from blame. Blame doesn't get us anywhere, because once you blame, you're stuck. There's, there's nowhere else to go, but rather to, to move to understand feelings um, identity. I'm really going fast here. So the feelings conversation is to understand that a lot of times it's easy and it's safe to deal with the conflict and <coughs> kind of like close it and move on and never have to talk about feelings. No one wants to talk about the feelings if you don't have to, right? No one wants to say, like in Maggie's situation, um, I felt taken advantage of but maybe I didn't want to say that to her. I just wanted to deal with what happened and close the book. My identity, I was concerned because I'm the faculty <laughs> member that gave her the okay to leave the building for lunch and come back. How did that make me look? What's my identity going to be with the dean or the outside counselor who trusted me? So there's other pieces that could be explored. Um, so we want to move into what we call a learning conversation, which is where we explore our stories. In fact, one of the challenges the book has here and and it's, it's very Christian, too, because we're going to get to a passage at the end. I challenge you, the next time you're in a conflict with someone, instead of going into the conflict and everything that's on your mind that you want to say, you say, you did this, you took the car, you, you, know, you said you weren't going to drink, you told us you would be at this house party, and you went to that. Before <coughs> you get into all the facts and all the blaming, stop. And then the next time you get into a conflict, tell the person, I want to understand what happened. And there's a, there's a page in this book, <coughs> they actually give you specific um, examples. Say a little bit more about how you see things. Tell me what, tell me why this, tell me what led you to make that decision. It's, so you hear, you listen, like the Bible says in James, right? Like, uh, be slow to speak and quick to listen. In a conflict, and this is hard, like what, what I'm saying. If you can listen before you speak, you might hear something that would inform a better understanding of why you're in that conflict. It doesn't excuse it, but it helps you to understand it. Um, and just because you listen, guys especially, I'm sorry I'm gonna single out, well guys and girls, but just because you listen to someone's story or their perspective doesn't mean you have to give up your own position. It doesn't mean you're weak, or doesn't mean you, you know, you're, comp you're compromising, you know, your, your, um, your integrity or anything of that sort. People are more likely, this is very important, to change if they feel understood. And this is really important for me to learn as a mom because sometimes I just wanna change you. I said you're not going out and that's it. I said you're going to sleep, put your head down and go to sleep, period. 
or whatever the case is. I said you're going to be a doctor, and that's what you're going to be. People, people can't be changed if they don't feel understood. In fact, people are more willing to shift to something they don't want and change if at least they feel understood. So I challenge you, and the next time you're in a difficult conflict or situation, listen first and see how it can inform um, your, you know, moving beyond that conflict. So I have three more minutes. Um, so exchange information, understand the con contribution system is very important. If I would say, and I'll use that example of the kid who got, who drank, was drinking and driving, in every conflict situation, you have a contribution. <laughs> Even if I'm the mom whose son took the keys and promised to be the designated driver and lied to me and drank and, 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 I still have a contribution. And I have to have the humility, going back to the other slide, and the self-awareness to realize, what contribution could I have had in this situation? Because you guys, we're all connected. Somehow we're all connected. I somehow inform his choices, maybe indirectly, maybe um, in ways that I'm not willing to see or admit, okay? I know that um, that's not, you know, I'm not getting into it enough. Each of these is like a chapter. Um, address and acknowledge the feelings and understand the identity issues which we, which we mentioned. Be willing to go where it's not comfortable. If you just wanna stay where it's comfortable, it's gonna be false, it's gonna be fake, and you're probably gonna <coughs> end up with resentment or back in another conflict with that person. Um, oh, did I? Did I move? Where's my, oh, this is not, oh, sorry. Why didn't you Did you turn it off? I, I don't think so. <coughs> Do you, huh? Oh, there was a blank screen in the middle. Okay. Okay. So the biblical instruction for handling conflict is very clear. We know about this. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. Have, pri have the respect to make conflict private initially. If it's not working, it goes, I mean, this, look how the wisdom of the Bible, it's what we just saw in those sheets. Then, if it's not working between you and the person, bring someone, bring a witness. So someone else can mediate, someone else can bring <coughs> another perspective, someone else can help you to stop talking and listen. Maybe you're not hearing something, um, okay? So this is the wisdom. And, you know, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established, that the evidence, the understanding, the feelings, maybe... I'm so focused on being right, I can't hear what my son is saying about the fact that he feels neglected or he feels not loved or whatever it is. Okay? Biblical approaches to conflict. So just briefly, even if we look at this example, God reconciled us to himself. His focus was what? Healing, restoration, reconciliation, and it was motivated by love. In Adam and Eve's situation, the first major, the first conflict we see, Adam blamed Eve, she blamed him, right? The focus was on blaming, shaming, avoiding the conflict, avoiding responsibility. And it was motivated by selfish ambition, again, or pride, like I said earlier. So the last I believe slide here is we need to seek peace. Peace, shalom, reconciliation, agreement, harmony, whatever you want to call it, and we need to pursue it. It's not something natural. It's not something easy. It's not something comfortable. It's not something that's going to be um, come naturally. But we need to seek peace and pursue it, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3. For God himself was pleased to have all his, full, was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus brings people back into a right relationship with God, with each other, with creation and the whole. Colossians chapter 1. And that's it. So I went only five minutes over. And Samir? Do we have time for one question? Okay, sir. There, there's a lot of information, so. Any, one question? One. One question. 
our one conflict that uh, you you couldn't see yourself um, approaching in this different way. Any questions or comments 